you Jump, 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 jump What we done started Look at what we done started This the people party This the people party how you doing, party people in the place to be? It's Talib Kweli, the MCEO, the BKMC. You now rocking with the best. You rocking with the world's best podcast and people's party. And as always, and as usual, I got my lovely and talented and thoughtful and thought-provoking co-host in the place to be, Jasmine Lee. How you feeling, Jasmine what up, Lee? What up, what up, what up? You know, I'm, I'm feeling great. I'm ready to do some digging. You ready to do some digging? Do some digging. We're going to do some digging. We're going to go in the we crates. Going? We're going to dig in, in the history of hip-hop. We're going to go to the birthplace. Today's episode, we're going to start with the birthplace of hip-hop, the Boogie Down Bronx. Our guest today is from the Boogie Down Bronx. He is one of the most important MCs, DJs, producers in the history of hip-hop. He is a centerpiece of the legendary Digging in the Crates crew, and his flow and his rhyme style is perhaps one of the most underrated and one of the most influential in hip-hop history. Together with DJ Mike Smooth on his debut album, The Funky Technician, he gave us groundbreaking bars and beats. Then he started to come into his own with his Return of the Funky Man, the sophomore album. Next, he worked with the notorious B.I.G. A.K. Biggie Smalls on Ready to Die Suicidal Thoughts. Produced a huge chunk of Big L's debut album, Lifestyles of the Poor and Dangerous. These are two landmark albums in hip-hop. His Third album, The Awakening, is his most personal album, and we're going to get into that one. It's a certified classic. Now, me speaking as an MC, and me speaking as a fan and as an active curator and participant in hip-hop, I got to say, the way that this man came in the game taught me personally so much about how to approach songwriting and how to approach writing bars and hip hop. Ladies and gentlemen, I need you to give it up for that bad mother, the funky technician, the funky man, the slick brother with the fade and the half moon, the funk soul brother himself. His friends call him Ness, we call him Lord Ness. Give it up. <laughs> Salute. Welcome, Lord. Good to see you. Good to see you. What's up, Finesse? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. How you good. feeling? Great. This is a conversation that's been a long time in the making. You Definitely. and me have spoken uh, online, and then we've run into each other in person a couple times and said we're going to do this, so I'm glad it's finally happening. No, I'm, I'm glad to be here. This is going to be uh, this is gonna be a good one. Yes, indeed, yes, indeed. So last time I saw you was in Puerto Rico, and you was with right. the homie uh, Russell Peters. Right. Oh, I feel like I met Russell Peters through Dave My New York. My birthday twin. That's your birthday twin? Mm -hmm. Oh, word. Okay. Uh, Dave New York, rest in peace. Did you know Dave New York? Could have. Uh, that's who I met Could've Russell Peters now. through. Shout out to Russell Peters. You was DJing. Yes. I was DJing. Definitely. Um, the last time I saw you before that, I do a party in Austin, Texas, which I'm about to fly out and do tomorrow. Oh, wow. That was me. Uh, called that Last Tuesday. So you yeah, came through yes, with the large yes. professor, Extra P. And uh, Lord Finesse got on the ones and twos. And tore the party yeah. down. It was beautiful. I was glad to get on, you know. I remember, yeah, Austin, Texas was crazy. Mm -hmm. They you told know. me that you went, they said, you know, Large Professor and uh, Lord Finesse are in town. I was like, oh, shit. So right before I got on, I threw a couple of y'all records in my crates for that right. night. And it was funny because I was playing. I'm like, oh, I'm going I'm to I'm let him know how much I respect them. And I'm, I'm playing <laughs> their records. And he came up to me. He's like, let me get on. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yes, absolutely. But you you played to the to the almost like like you played like three in the morning that night. It was nah, that night was it was a great night. It was a great night. I went out to Austin to because I missed Lars Professor's birthday mm -hmm. in um New York. Mm -hmm. So I was like, um, I'm gonna meet you in Austin. Mm -hmm. So I flew into Austin to hang out with him, catch his show. And then it was like, yo, it's this other event with Taleb there. Mm -hmm. So it was like, boom. It was like, yo, they they might want me to get on. So okay. I'm like... Oh, somebody gave you that yeah, word. I, I, you had to get your I fingers ready. I was them like, yo, you know what? Don't even worry about it. I got you. Right, right, right. So when the promoter came, it was like, yo, you know, yo, Lodge, you want to get on? I was like, yo, P, I got this. You right. Know? Paul, me and Paul go way back. Lodge Professor, mm -hmm. if y'all don't know him as Paul. Right. But uh, we go way back to the beginning of my career. I was introduced to him uh, through Premier, DJ Premier, mm -hmm. also at the beginning of my career. So, Large has been like one of my mentors. Mm -hmm. 
I've learned a lot from him, especially uh, production wise, because before I even got into production, I would go to Queens mm-hmm. and, you know, I would sit and wait for him to show up mm-hmm. and I would just be vibing with him all day, watching him do beats. So a lot of stuff he was teaching me never really dawned on me until I became a producer. Right. Then it was like everything he taught me or was showing me just all made sense. Like, oh, I, I get it now. Yeah. You know, but before that, it was like, he was like, yo, you know what snare this is? And I was like, no. And he would do that. And to the point where... Now, if you 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 hit a snare, I could tell yeah. you where the snare is from. Yeah, mm. you know? a lot of people credit, rightfully so, Q Tip, with being like like so inspirational to a certain style of production, right? right. But a lot of people who don't know, a lot of people hip hop started with Tropical Quest, but Q Tip, in my estimation, was learning from Large Professor. Large is a genius. Yeah. You know, I tell them this all the time. You know, I've learned so much from them. But you got to understand, this dude, when you listening to Cool G Rap, mm-hmm. um, won a Dead or Alive album. Mm-hmm. A lot of that production is Paul. It's actually P. Yeah. yeah. For him to be doing that in high school. Yeah. That, that's, that's like incredible. So imagine yeah. if you did a beat. For like cool G rap during your high school era, right. and you go, yeah, I just produced these songs in the high school. So nah, Paul was way ahead of his time, still ahead of his time. One of my biggest influences, uh, influences besides my brother Show. Right. When it comes to the SB twelve hundred, it's large and it's Show. Mm. So I've learned from. Yeah. Two of the masses the on the 12. Not just masses, but architects. Yeah. Like the inventors of this style. Definitely. Like Diamond D said, gotta give a shout to the large professor. Thought I lost his number, but I, I left, left it on a dresser. dresser. Word is wrong. To quote you in Funky Technician, rough and tough because I come from a bad block. What was it like growing up in the Bronx, 166 crew, in the gang era when hip-hop was first starting? I think growing up in the Bronx, you know, I was... Uh, I was raised by my grandmother. Mm -hmm. So I was raised in the projects, Forest Projects. And um, coming from there, but that was like a a village, Mm -hmm. you know, because you're in the project, but it's also a village. Yeah. Because when my grandmother wasn't around and I was out there in the streets doing what I was doing, whatever I was doing, you still had the love of of the community, you know, Forest Projects. And when, you know, I think of Forest Projects, I automatically think of uh, Fat Joe mm-hmm. and think of my brother's show and think of Diamond and thinking of even Coco from SWV. Mm. You know, we was all from the same neighborhood. You know, growing up in that village is like if you fucked up, you know, somebody else's parent could whip your ass. Right. It takes a village to raise a child. Right. Right. You know, now it's like, oh, don't don't talk to my child. Or, mm-hmm. You know, nah. You know, you get fucked up by somebody else's parent, and then your parent will come on top with the double ass with you. embarrass me. You know, so, I mean, growing up in the projects, it was it was a unique thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I wouldn't, you know, the hood is the hood, but I think growing up, the way I grew up just taught me so much. Yeah. Now, you, as far as my introduction to you, and you could tell me if this is where you feel like you got your start, but I feel like you got signed and then you started, then you entered the new music seminar. You right, right? Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the only way you could enter the music, the new music seminar is if you were signed if you to were a signed. label. Right. So, so you had obviously made your name on the streets before then. Right. Right. So I think, um, I forgot who took me to the new music seminar, but when I went there in 88, I seen a wall of MCs from left to right. Yeah. And they was going up to battle each other. So I made my name on the street, but I'm like, no, this this is what I want to do. Mm. Yeah, and for people who don't know, and, and and Jared, you know, Jared is founder of Ruckus Records. Right. right? So, you know, we've we've we you know, we've been do in, in this together for a long time. And I was gonna say this to you the, the other day that the story of what the new music seminar represented from the from the early 80s when it started to whereas I was in there watching Super Nat and Craig G go back and forth and to what that meant to MC and to DJing 
Um, I don't feel like that story's been told. New Music Seminar was just a whole nother level mm-hmm. because you you had your street reputation, but then you got all these uh, different artists that are considered the top on top and you wanted to go against them. Mm-hmm. I mean, any artist or MC wants to go up against the best. Mm-hmm. You don't want to... I, I never felt like if I was top in the neighborhood, I was top in the world. Mm-hmm. I went to different places to battle people mm-hmm. And that's what kind of introduced me to so many different people. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of the first people was A.G. Mm -hmm. Now, my brother, Forty. Forty is a brother I grew up with, my brother Omar. He was in 975. I was 965. He went to Clinton. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when he went to Clinton at the time, Antoinette was just coming out. Okay. And he told me, like, yo, Antoinette go to my school. I was, word? I'm coming up to your school. So I went up there to kind of meet Antoinette and mm-hmm. wind up getting into a battle with all these MCs, and that's how I met AG. Okay. So during me uh, working on a funky technician, AG was dating a female across the street from where I lived. Mm-hmm. So I was an MC, but I would DJ on the side. So, you know, uh, he was uh, telling his girl, like, yo, I need a, I need a DJ. Mm-hmm. So he said, all right, we're going to go get Rob. He ain't know me as Rob. He mm-hmm. know me as Lord Finesse. So when I came into the living room, I'm like, Infinite? Because that was his name. It right. wasn't even A.G. It was so Infinite. A.G.'s name is Infinite? Yes. So he sounded like a God body name. Yeah, it was a God body Okay, name. okay. So um, at the time, I started working on Funky Technician, mm-hmm. and I was asking him, do he still rhyme? And he mm-hmm. was like, yeah. So I was like, oh, shit, okay, I'm working on my album. I want you to be on my album. And that's why AG is the only feature on my album. Twice. Mm -hmm. Twice. Mm -hmm. And during that time, you know, I had Premiere. Mm -hmm. I had Show. I had Diamond. I had a great crew of producers that wasn't even the the name producers at the time. So That's why I called it. Y'all innovators. I'm like, this is y'all was inventing something. Show was looking for artists. Mm -hmm. AG was looking for a DJ, and that's how you got showing AG. Showbiz. Mm. No, no, no. Right. AG. So Diamond, Diamond taught me everything about James Brown. Mm-hmm. Diamond is a James Brown junkie. Mm-hmm. You know, so to have Premier Show and, and Diamond on that album and then AG, that was just the beginning of the whole, the whole DITC. Word. All right, so shout out to Diamond D. I always think about our time in Miami whenever he comes up. On oh the yeah, show. we had a great time in Miami. Great time. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, obviously, you and Quali have had very fruitful collaborations with Diamond D and OG digging in the crates member. Um, can you tell us a story of how you, or tell us the story of how you and Diamond D met? Okay, me and Diamond, we go back. We go <laughs> back to Catholic school. Okay? Oh wow. We went to Catholic school called Saint Augustine's in the Bronx. And um, Diamond was probably on his last year. I was on my first year. But as the years went on, I've known Diamond forever. When I was in Morris High School, it was a path that I would take to go to high school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would have to go by Diamond Window. So as I'm walking through this path, going by Diamond Window, he will always have the shades down. Okay. And you hear this, psst, yo, going to school today? (laughs) <laughs> I'm like, yeah, my mom's ain't here. Let's make a tape. Oh. All right, I'm going to come through after homeroom. That's, so oh, after, after homeroom. That's home smart. <laughs> check in. Yeah, after oh, homeroom. I, I know this life. I, would, I know uh, this life. <laughs> I would go to Diamond Crib and I would watch him cut and DJ and we would make tapes. You know, mm-hmm. so me and Diamond go back to, to that factor, wow. like the beginning. You know, I won't say before Mike Smooth because Mike Smooth was like, Mike Smooth was like my bigger brother in the mm-hmm. neighborhood because, um, like y'all was saying, it takes a, a village to raise a child. Mm-hmm. So it was him. It was a bunch of fellas I grew up with that would look after me because I was the only child. It was mm-hmm. just me and my grandmother. So Mike Smooth was like my bigger brother. Shout so when Smooth. I worked out on Funky Technician, I'm like, nah, we got to get beats from Diamond and Show. Right. You know, and that's how that all came into play. You know, you guys were skipping, but at least you were being productive while you were there. 
that's that life though. That's what I was doing. Like what you just said, like, look, now I understand why I feel connected to you from that era because mm. we was doing the same shit. Y'all was just on before me. You look, you know what I'm saying? Like y'all was just putting it together. Like when I seen the scene in the movie Juice, right. when uh the dude is running out the school right. and the security guard run after him, that was my life. <laughs> what? That was I was like, yo, that's realistic right there. People don't don't understand your passion gotta have a purpose. Yes. Mm-hmm. And when your passion have a purpose, that that makes you want to just bet it all on that on that on that purpose, mm-hmm. you know. So for me, music has always been my passion. You know that that became my purpose on on all levels, yeah. whether from an artist perspective or a producer's perspective. It's just like you have to understand and love the art, mm-hmm. and when you love that. And then you're great at it, then everything else will fall into place. Yeah. Now, on Hey, Look at Shorty, you say, I was the funkiest rapper in the lunchroom. Now, again, this is my life because right. I was going to Brooklyn Tech. And Brooklyn Tech had 5,000 kids and four different lunchrooms, north, south, east, west. Oh, wow. Damn, four so, lunchrooms? Yeah, four that's lunchrooms. Oh, shit. So, that would have been like a tour in my shit. That's what it was. So it was like I would check in the homeroom. <laughs> And then I would go to the McDonald's on the corner and then we'd be in on the tables in the McDonald's. And then for two periods, and then after two periods, lunch would start. The first lunch would start. Right. And you could do four periods of lunch. So I would just go in the lunchroom. I'd be in the lunchroom for four periods, be on the tables ramen. But you in four different lunchrooms. No, he means- yeah, because because after the, the bell ring, you get up and you go to the next lunchroom. Yeah, so, so you, you got four different go. cafeterias. Yeah, it's just the north one, the east one, the south one. So you could, like, you wouldn't get caught being in lunch for four periods because you could just go to a different... Nah, he was on yeah. fucking tour early. He was clearly on... Tom Levin <laughs> toured his whole tour life. Early. I mean... On <laughs> tour beating on the tables. My shit was... I went to Park West for electrical mm-hmm. engineering. Mm-hmm. When I got there, that was, that program was no longer available. Okay. That's why I found myself in the gym and mm-hmm. in the lunchroom. Mm-hmm. But we only had one lunch. Okay. Most schools you do. Know, we ain't we ain't have four... It, it was a lot of different dudes in the lunchroom. You know, Park West, a lot of Brooklyn dudes, a lot of Harlem dudes. I remember Eminon, the beatboxer. Mm-hmm. So you got another beatboxer from Harlem besides Dougie. His name was Eminon. Uh, Rich Nice. Mm-hmm. Rich Nice went to Park West. Mm-hmm. Uh, Shout MF, Rich nice. Gr- MF Grimm. Grimm, who was battling in the, new West. Me- in the seminar. Right. Yeah. Well, I knew Grimm from high school, but I never knew King's son was Grimm's brother. Right, right. So that's how I met King's son. And then you had Esther Best. You had a, a bunch of... Kane even went to Park West. Mm, okay. But I, okay. I, I missed the Kane era. See, this, these are the you rudiments know? of New York City hip-hop right here. And so what you're talking about is the development of different styles. So you, right. you go into high school, you battling people in high school, and then you then you then whoever's the best of that is making it to New Music Seminar. And so the way that you rap, the compound rhyme style, right. the three syllables as opposed to two, two syllables, this style was, AG was on the style, and then later Big L had this style, right. which is why big people were saying Big L sound like you, because it was like he was influenced Right. By this particular style of rap, I'm mystical, musical. I might confuse a few. Lord finesse, getting funky as usual. I was also this is the this is the casing, like if you have it like a sausage, right? This is the casing in which I was writing. This right. is how I started writing based on that because y'all was like the youngest and the freshest. Y'all had the freshest slang, the freshest clothes. I think you, you, I might have heard dead ass first from you. <laughs> in a record, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Which the first time I heard dead ass. Today. The first time I heard dead ass has to be a Lord Finesse song. Well, my style come from my heroes. Hip to the game, you know. Dead ass. My my <laughs> style definitely come from my heroes, which mm-hmm. was Kane, Rakim, Karis, One, mm-hmm. um, Cool G, Rap. Mm-hmm. During that time, you just wish you could be as great as them, mm-hmm. or you'll be noticed or be. Uh, your name would would uh, ring like their name would mm-hmm. ring. So with the compounds was just different compounds and metaphors. Because mm-hmm. funny I just, too with the jokes. That was that's the snapping error. That's yeah. the projects. Yeah, that's you know, your mother's so fat. You know, your right. mother's just so black. You know, that's where you know a lot of the 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 wit and the funniness and the humor came from. 
was from snapping, mm-hmm. and it was just like me putting it in rhymes mm-hmm. and then doing metaphors and similes. And I think some of the greatest punchlines is when you don't see them coming. Yep. Right. If I could predict your punchline and see where it's coming from, it ain't that great. You see that in the new battle raps that they be doing when they when they are going at each other and somebody's about to come with a punchline and the man right. next to him will say the punchline with him. Yeah. Like, because, no, you're being too predictable. Yeah, like... We were looking to say the most cleverest things, mm-hmm. use the most odd vocabulary, because you got to understand. Said impetuous. Yes, we were looking a specialist, impetuous. Yeah, we were looking <laughs> to to just do something different. Mm-hmm. We wasn't looking to sound like anybody else. We was looking to outwit you, and I think a lot of that it became fun when it was me and it was A and it was L. Mm-hmm. Because we think of the slickest thing to say, that mm-hmm. was that that was crazy, you know. Mm-hmm. Like L was just the ultimate comedian. I'm sicker than a dude that's in special ed. I suggest you spread pretzel head before I turn your white sweatsuit red. <laughs> right, right. You know the the wit of it all was which which would always kept us going because. We freestyling before anybody know it was records. So we hearing this stuff and it was crazy to us. Like I said, rap is an art from the metaphors to the punchlines, mm-hmm. to the flows, to the presence. It's all an art from the beginning to how a rhyme start to how it ends. I was, me and Kane was talking one day and we was building on writing rhymes and I always equivalated, you know, rhymes to boxing. Mm-hmm. You know, nowadays you got dudes that's throwing straight haymakers. Right. Punchline, punchline, punchline. And my and my era was like jab, jab, jab. Yeah. Wow, left. Right. Jab, jab, jab. Wow, left. Right. You never seen it coming. Right. The one, two, the setup. Yeah. Like you getting set up by words, yeah. and then the punchline come over and just jab you. Right. So it was always, it was always, and still today, it's a craft to me. It's not, it's not just rhyming. It's, it's more of a craft. It's a lot of wit. It's intelligence. It's so much to rhyming than just rhyming. Yeah. Do you guys feel like when you're, because I mean, both of you have big vocabularies, but do you find yourself like looking at their sources and things like that for like words that you want to like? Go with, or are you just going off the dome? In my earlier years, I was using a thesaurus. Right. Definite. The kids, well, a thesaurus is a book that has cinnamon. No, in that era, I re, in that era, and tell me if you did this, but I would carry around a thesaurus. A dictionary? Uh, yeah, oh, thesaurus. A, like a pocket one. I had it in the house. Yeah, I would carry right? it like a pocket one. I don't do that anymore, but what I just what I do do now. Sometimes you find, a, sometimes the rhyme comes before it makes sense. Mm. So you get yes. the rhyme pattern, you're like, this word rhyme with this word. But then for me, because I do conscious hip hop, people criticize like I, my shit got to be on point. Like I've I've said the wrong thing. Like I think I said I said something on 2000 seasons. I said something about the Warren Commission, right? And I didn't get it historically right. You know what I'm saying? That, that happens. Yeah, I, I had people that that didn't make no sense. You yeah. know, I had that. But to this day and time, mm-hmm. to your to what you're talking about. If you was to ever find me writing a rhyme, you would never see a full all-out rhyme, mm-hmm. right? You would see words that rhyme, mm-hmm. and you go, what do you mean? Auditioning for broads, listening to frauds, get right. down with the lords. But then you got to make it all fit together. Shit retarded, sister's closet. Wait, right. what that? And when I say it, then it's like, when you tired of listening to frauds auditioning for broads, my shit religion, you need to get down with the Lord. Because nowadays, man, shit's retarded when it's cool to wear shit out your sister's closet. Right. And they go, oh, that makes sense. Right. But if you was to find it and just see the words, you go, I don't get it. Yeah. Now, what you were saying earlier about your influences, KRS, uh, Big Daddy Kane, Rakim, we had DOC on, right? right. And DOC... I asked him about the formula, and he said some shit to split my wig. He said, um, "He said the formula was a tribute to my influences. Wow. High energy, flowing with the wisdom. That's KRS One. Sense of rich man. That's Slick Rick. Knowledge in the rhythm. That's Rakim." And I was like, "Okay, that now." Oh wow! You know that, what I'm saying? That, that it makes sense when you put it in that perspective, right? 
for me, it, it's the same, mm-hmm. right? Funky Technician was me finding my way. Mm-hmm. And it was a tribute to my heroes. Right. Lesson to be taught was Karis One. Yeah. Slave to my sound wave was Rakim. Right. If you heard Rakim say the words, clear the crowd and get the stage set. You still got time to put a tape in your tape deck. Mm -hmm. Sit down, relax as I drive facts. Rhymes trap the crowd once I got them down packed. That's Rakim. Right. You know, um, keep it flowing. It's Kane. Back to back was G Rap. G Rap. Equip the flip with the slip of a lip, so dance, hop, or skip, or shake your hip. I'll wax and tax, eat you up like a Kit Kat. Don't even rip back. I ain't even with that. That's, that's G-Rap. Right. So the funky technician was me patterning myself behind my heroes. Uh, Return of the Funky Man kind of started putting law of finesse in perspective. Right. And then Awakening just was something totally other. Okay. On Here I Come, you say Slick Brother with the Fade and the Half Moon. How deep was your half moon? That sounds really... How deep... How deep, how deep was your half moon? How deep was your half moon? And where it did the hairstyle... It's <laughs> pretty deep. And where did the hairstyle originate from? What's the origin of the hairstyle? Well, the hairstyle, I don't even know. I just know, you know, I like the fade. I would get the fade and the half moon was like... Forgot where I got that from, but that was early in the game <laughs> where it's like, yo, he finished everything up. Yo, give me the half moon real quick. And then you I think put that's that a New York moon. thing, though. I don't know if that anybody. That was I definitely seen a New York Nobody thing. any place else did the half moon. Not that I know of because, you know, you get people that pop up. Yo, we did it here. And, you know, <laughs> but we talking about um like 89, mm-hmm. 88. Mm-hmm. You know, so that was something. It was a style. I thought the shit looked fly because you get the the fresh half moon, and then I, you know, I had the half moon and the fresh fade. So, How old were you on? Were you nineteen years old when you did Funky Technician? When I started doing Funky Technician, like I was a, nineteen. You look like a baby on that album cover. Yeah. <laughs> um, right after the new music seminar, me and Premier went in the studio and started working on. Funky Technician. Stu Fine wasn't too sure about me as an artist. Mm-hmm. Guru picked my demo tape out of the demo tapes. So and this so, is, yeah, because you're talking about, you sh- you you actually are talking to Premier throughout that yes. record. Yes. But you also had a re- re- relationship with Guru as well, right? Yeah. Guru was like an A&R at Wild Pitch Records. Right. And he's the one that picked my cassette tape out and told Stu, you got to sign this dude. Mm-hmm. So from that point, the New Music Seminar was coming up, and Premier was coming fresh from Texas. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's sitting in the crowd with Premier. Yeah, we signed this dude. I'm not sure. You know, would you like to work with him? Right. And Premier seen me and was like, oh, hell yeah. When, right. when can we get started? And right after the seminar, we, we got started. Right. So I was the first act outside of Guru that Premier worked with. Shout out to my my twin, DJ Premier. That's my twin. Definite. Um, All right, so you discovered Big L at the record store. Can you walk us through that meeting? And what do you think it was about him that compelled you? Well, I was doing an autograph signing in this record store on 125th Street called Rock and Well. Mm-hmm. I was doing mixtapes in there. That's where I met Buck Wild. Mm-hmm. So I'm doing an autograph signing this dude comes in, him and his man. Mm-hmm. He comes in, but he, you know, Al was too cool. I'm gonna send mm-hmm. my man over. Yo, my dude wanna rhyme for you. He's nice. Yeah, you know, I was hearing that shit left and right. Right. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, I'm gonna give him my manager's number. And, you know, he chalked that up with my manager. If my manager say he's nice, then I work with him. So, mm-hmm. you know, he went back, told Al. Al was like, fuck that. <laughs> Tell him I rhyme for him now, and right. if I'm whack, I never rhyme for him again. Word. So I'm like, a oh, word? Is that? It's like that. So L. Oh, it's like that. It's now. the confidence. <laughs> yeah, he came and and when he rhymed for me, I've never heard a cat at that age that polished. Mm-hmm. You know, of course, it was a lot of things he needed to work on, but for that age, had to be sixteen or seventeen. He was sharp. Mm. I mean, when he finished rhyming for me, I was asking for his numbers. Mm. 
You know, I want the beeper number, house number, you know, because I've, I've never ran across uh, a kid that talented. You know, I'm I'm around AG. I'm around my crew. Right. So I'm in Harlem hearing him, and I'm like, yo, he's the next level. Of course, it, it's, it's a ton of similarities when you compare Al to me. Mm-hmm. But the difference is I've seen the upside. If you this nice now, I know you're going you're gonna to be a you're going to be a monster. Mm-hmm. You know, and what it was, it was like I would pick him up from, you know, I got a half a day of school. Go pick him up. Wow. You know, that's why you see him if you look at the MTV footage. It was like if I had an interview, he had an interview. Mm-hmm. Right. If I had a show, he had a show. Right. That's why we were so tight. It wasn't like, yo, you my little man, and I'm, and I no, I treated him as an equal from day one. Yes. So when he got to a level where he was, he was, he was on fire. He knew I was still his man. It wasn't like, all right, I remember he sunned me. So now, mm-hmm. you know, now I'm on. Nah, right. it was, it was like I can remember the last conversation we had. It was like, yo, you good? Yo, I got these five records set up. I'm about to sign over here with Rock and yo, you, 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 you all right? right? You know? Right. And it it was just, it was the greatest blessing to know that, you know, I was a part of this dude legacy. And I was there, I was there to witness it all. And, you know, I man, I was I was so proud of that dude that I couldn't begin to tell you. Because yeah. I've I've seen him come up from the bottom to when he was with Sony. Uh-huh. And um, like I said, Sony lost track of him because, uh-huh. you know, he was there, got four mics in the sauce. We think, oh, he good. Uh-huh. Devil son. Okay, lifestyles of the poor and dangerous, he good. Nas came, Illmatic, uh-huh. superstar lineup, L gets pushed to the side. Uh-huh. Right after that, Fuji's L get pushed uh-huh. to the side. To the fact where, you know, we're going to let you go. Uh-huh. And to any artist, that could have been it for him. And he put out, he put out Ebonics on his own label, Flamboyant, and he, he weathered the storm and became two, you know, L 2.0, as I would say. L, yeah, and, then, was... and then I just watched him just just flourish. So yeah. to see that and know you a part of that, that's that's one of the I think my greatest blessings in the in the whole rap game, besides me even getting on doing what I'm doing. To be able to be a part of that dude's life is, yeah. Yes, indeed. Shout out to Showbiz. I know you, you mentioned Show a couple of times, mm-hmm. and I know he's hugely influential to you and to the game. Um, you were inspired by Show. Definitely. And, and Primo and Diamond to start making beats. Show um, on, on several levels. You know, um, when I was doing my DJing thing, I have equipment. I would go to Show House. He would give me the keys and go, all right, lock up when you finish. Right. And I would do my mixtapes and show crib. And same thing. You leave me in a house, 1,200 there, mm-hmm. and I done watched them do some stuff, and now I'm practicing on the 1,200. Mm-hmm. So when I finally got my own, all of the lessons, like I said, between show and large, it yeah. just, just felt like I, I learned the cheat code. Yeah, I mean, these are innovators. You was right there with them. Um, and then you ended up producing like a large part of Big L album, right? Because that was my first beats. Yeah, that was your first beats. <laughs> that was the first beats because I remember um, uh, doing the You Know What I'm About soundtrack. Mm-hmm. And I remember taking that money and buying equipment. And I brought a 1200 brought a 950 and brought a turntable. And like I said, history show large and then Jess West. People don't know who Jess West is. I know who Jess West is. Jess West is the one that produced uh uh Step Into the World, KRS one, right? Mm. Yes, yes. He showed me how to work the nine fifty and I locked myself in the house for about two weeks. And the earliest beats that I did was on Lifestyles of the Porn Dangerous mm-hmm. and Fat Joe's Living Fat. Mm-hmm. That was all done Within that two week span, 
Now, Jess, Jess West uh, has, uh, you know, I didn't, I've never met him. Right. I was a fan, you know, the third eye, right? Third eye. Right. But Jesse West introduced you to Puff, right? Right. And and put right. you, I got you like, down with Big like, to yeah. do Suicidal Thoughts. Yeah. So during the time of me learning how to produce, he was like, yo, you need to play some of this for Puff. Right. And that that was big early in the game. I mean, bef- that was uh, around the um, Who's the Man soundtrack. Oh, man, what a great soundtrack. Yeah. If you listen to What's Next on the Menu, I did an ad lib on that record because we was okay. all in soundtrack. Okay. I also produced Ease Up. That's okay. on... Uh, I did a Party and Bullshit remix. Right. We was all in there. Peter's like, yo, listen to this. Right. And I heard that... Let's see what's next on the menu. I was like, wow. That's crazy. He was like, yo, I need you to do this ad lib at this point. And I, and I that's did that's it. What, who, who got the verse? Uh, Pop to spans, plots to scams. That was that on that? Is that Heavy D verse? I got Pop to spans. Pop to spans. So make way for the big man. Yeah, that's, that's, that's Heavy that's, D that's, verse. That's Heavy D. Yeah. yeah. That's a good record. Yeah, I mean, that, that soundtrack was dope. That was Puff before Bad Boy. Right. So I was... Like, people talk about the hitmen, but they never mention Jess West, or they never mention Tony Dofat or, mm. or Chucky Thompson. Those is like, that's the original hitmen before the hitmen. Right. You know, like, if it wasn't for Jess, I wouldn't have met Puff. Right. You know, so definitely salute to Jess. I fell down a Lord Finesse rabbit hole on the internet. And I came across the EPK, which is an electronic press kit for the Awakening album. Now, I, there's an EPK for Reflection Eternal, yeah. right. hosted by Dave Chappelle. Oh. It's on YouTube. Mm. It's a great find. And it's funny because in that era, there was no social media. Right. And so we spent money on electronic press kits that we set to people in industry, right? Right. That never saw the light of day to fans, the public. But if you watch them now, they're great historical documents. Definitely. And it just shows you the, the like inefficiency of the music business. Because these, it costs a lot of money to make an EPK. Yeah. Right. It gives you like a documentary without giving you a documentary. Right. And we should have been capitalizing on these. But right. we were so concentrated at that time as artists and as executive people in the business on our own shit. Right. That we weren't thinking about how to properly make a profit. But anyway, Kid right. Capri, who we just did a FaceTime with, is on his EPK. Definitely. And he says on the EPK, he's trying to advertise The Awakening. And right. he said, you need to listen to The Awakening because... Lord Finesse got shorted on his deal. And so when Diamond on the Tribe Called Quest album, he's replacing Grand Pooba on the verse because Grand Pooba said some shit that he couldn't put out. Oh, wow. Right? Never so, knew that one. <laughs> yeah. So I, I've, I've never heard the original version of the song, but, you know, this is, this is legend. Right. Diamond D says, you don't want to make a pitch this wild, which we yeah. all knew was this and wild pitch, which was the label that you was involved with. Right. So is this all a part of the same industry rules of 4,080? Somewhat. Okay. I mean, with the EPK, you know, Kid felt that that could have got promoted more. They only had one one video um, strictly for the ladies. That's what Kid was talking on. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, me and Kid go back, once again, to the beginning of my career. I got turned on to Kid by his mixtapes and had the pleasure of meeting him at the Castle. Castle was the spot that was rocking in the Bronx on Thursdays. Mm-hmm. And me and Kid would just sit up and talk about music till uh, till the sun come up. Right as Bob. You know, so, man, when, when it's time to tell my story, there's so many different ways to go with it mm-hmm. from people that was there from the beginning. But he was definitely there from the beginning. So when we was talking about the EPK, mm-hmm. you know, during the EPK, it was, a, a, like you said, electronic press kit, which is still powerful now. It's just yeah. that everybody goes straight for fucking videos. Right. Like, you got to introduce people to who you are. Something got to tell your story. Mm-hmm. Especially now the uh, game is oversaturated. There's too many people rhyming, too many videos out. Who are you? Mm-hmm. I always tell... An artist, if I was to get something from you that I couldn't get from nowhere else, what would it be? Right. 
And if you stuck right there, that means you you don't got nothing different from what everybody else is offering. Mm -hmm. So I I came up with the idea of electronic press kit because it told your story. Right. Mm -hmm. And and I use other people to tell my story that personally knew me. Right. And they like, oh, I'm think I'm gonna get this awakening album. Right. This is different. Right. But like I said, a lot of the stuff works now. It's just that artists got to use their wit to put it together. Right. But you need an electronic press kit to tell your story. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, especially to pitch yourself and get some managers on the other end, not music. Right. Um, you said The Awakening is one of your most personal albums. Why do you think you started finally letting us in more? The Awakening was one of my personal albums because I got, it was just me. It was all me. It was the first time I had reins to do a whole project with no interference with the trust mm. of the owner of the label, which was Neil Levine. Mm -hmm. So when he brought me to a uh, penalty, he said, yo, Lord, I just want you to do what you do. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like, yo, we need a radio hit. We need this. We need that. No, just do you. Mm -hmm. He understood everything what The Awakening was about, even to the point where one weekend I seen Roy Ayers in Bryant Park. And I was like, yo, Neil, I want to work with Roy. And next thing you know, that next week, Roy is in the studio right. and we doing Soul Plan. So he right. got it. And that's something you and I share together that we have records with Roy Ayers. Yeah, man. Yeah. I, that's one of my favorites. Yes. Him and Stevie. Yes. And I produced, damn near, 90% of that album except for Actual Facts, which was Mike Lowe and Jess West. Speak Your Peace, which was Mike Lowe again. So, but most of the rest of that album is all produced by me. And that was the first time that I produced the album. And if you've seen Hip to the Game, you've seen Game Plan, mm -hmm. you've seen Actual Facts, I wrote the script for all those videos. Right. So it was the first time I got to write something that I felt comfortable doing. Because, you know, at Return of the Funky Man, that, that shit was all over the place. Mm -hmm. Had me in a train station running here. You're talking about the video? Yeah, had me doing playing Dice in Midtown. Come on, you know I saw an no interview with you where, you where you said that the director was telling you to act hard. You were like, I don't know how to act hard. I know how to be me. Hey. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and you have to do videos that reflect you. Mm -hmm. That's where you shine the best at. Mm -hmm. And in this scene, we want you to act tough and <laughs> fold right. your arms. And like, nah, that shit is corny. Mm -hmm. And he had me like, they come with these weird treatments for your video, got you looking all crazy. <laughs> right. We're, we're hip to the game. It was fun. Right. It looked fun. It did. Everything about the next videos had me doing what I like to do. And it's your people. And it, you come off natural. Because, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's funny, right? I could perform in front of 50,000. Mm -hmm. No problem. If I'm shooting a video and we on the street rolling and, and I'm trying to do the video and people walking by looking at me, I'm thrown off. Because in a video... You are imitating what it means to be a rapper. You are doing an impersonation uh, because you're the video is is a product that you're using to sell the tune. Right. So you're right. like you're doing a caricature of yourself, right. and it's like that's fine if you if you if you are comfortable around your people. But on the street, it might feel funny. Well, I'm from an era where you were taught you had to be you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You couldn't do all that fake shit. You get right. tested every time. You get tested, yeah. When we're not in that era, you can act as fraudulent as you want, and it, and it looks good. Everybody's with it. it yeah, as long as it right. looks right. They can, as long as they can package it, because people will excuse it by with capitalism. They'll say, "Well, it's selling. It's entertainment. It's, he's it's he's doing something right." right. But like, some people don't know to draw the line between entertainment and and record sales. Mm -hmm. Right. You want to front until you test it. Mm -hmm. Then it's entertainment. Mm -hmm. But if you could get away with it, then that's that's how I am, you know? Right. So I, I'm from an era where, you know, I was taught by my OGs to just be cool. Mm -hmm. Don't let nobody disrespect you. Always get your respect. But be cool. You don't have to do all that extra shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So when you shoot in a video and it's a like, act like this, it's like, yo, dude, I don't do none of that, you know? My first real video, John, you remember this was, was it David Nelson? Is that his name? Yeah, Dave Nelson. David, Dave Nelson used to work with Outcast. He came out of video treatment for Move Something. With Dave in it. With Dave Chappelle's in it, yeah. The video treatment is us going through the motions of everything that rap video directors expect you to do. Uh. Right. You know what I'm saying? And then why we won't do it. That's what the video was about. Ah, uh, dope. Yeah. <laughs> What he's talking about reminds me of uh, season one of Wu Tang when they had to do the the video and he had the top hat and all of that. Oh, with the Prince Rakim videos. Yeah, Prince Rakim. Before video. he became Rizzo, yeah, when he had I've, to. I've known, we love you, Rakim. Yeah, I've known. I've known Rizzo since that. Yeah, point. you know, right. if you listen to him, think Slade to my sound wave. I gave a shout out to him. Yeah, you know, I've I've known about Wu before it was Wu. Mm -hmm. Rizza and Genius. Mm -hmm. And the I've, words I've, from the Genius. I've always known Genius was nice. Right. Before they redid. Right. When he was, when you, with, you could hear the records, the like, Come Do Me era. Yeah. And it's like, you, he's doing a certain style of record that was working for the radio, but you could hear it in bars. Like, oh, okay. Right. You, you could always hear the craft behind the mm -hmm. artists. You know, I just think nowadays we don't have enough artists. And and that's really what it is. And people don't want to put in the work either because, like, you see so many, um, even, like, uh, Coast uh, Country with just with their freestyle, and they're talking about if you don't have followers, you're not nothing. Like, people don't want to develop artists. They want you to come already with 100,000-plus followers and, uh, you know, instead of actually putting in work to your craft. I don't know, man. I always make a joke about the followers thing because, you know, I tell somebody if they want followers and shit, this is my joke. You know, walk out there with your boy and your boy hold a drum machine. Throw yourself out in the street, get hit by a car. And when you get hit by a car while the ambulance come and do a beat and have your boy film it. It's pretty extreme. And, and hey, if you want followers, you'll get a million followers behind right. that. You'll get, you'll get a two million views. But I just think we're, we're losing the craft. Mm -hmm. Even deeper than that. I had to go back and find out what made music fun because I didn't know why I was at odds with myself industry-wise because when you come in as an artist, you're hungry. Mm -hmm. You're an artist. Once you get into the industry, it doesn't seem anything you do will ever be good enough. Mm. Yeah. They turn it into a business, which it is. But they take the fun out of it. They take the craft out of it. And I, I found like why well, don't why well, I don't like music no more. Hmm. And um I remember Jazzy Jeff, right? Shout out. Um I was watching him talk to another artist. And uh he was asking the artist, put some music out. Everybody would love to hear you do some music. And um the artist was like, nah, I had a lot of bad uh a lot of bad experiences. Things ain't work right. They're calling me the old head. They're calling me this. They're calling me that. And this one line he says sticks to me to this day. I always tell him when I see him. He said, "What did music ever do wrong to you?" Mm. And he said, "Well, I don't. I don't get what you're saying." He said, "I hear what you're talking about the industry and you talk right. about this, that, and the third. What the fuck did music do right. to Those you are the people. that you're taking your anger out on music?" Mm -hmm. And I was like, "Wow, that was." That was deep. Yeah, shout out to Jazzy Jeff. Because I never, I, I never looked at it that way, that sometime that the game could get you so frustrated that you'll take your anger out on the very thing that got you out the struggle, mm -hmm. that introduced you to the world, that took you around the world. You, you can't let the industry do that to you. You got to stay with your love for the music. Fuck the industry. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it just made me uh, realize how much that I wasn't utilizing music to the fullest that I could and, and making you love it again. Because like I said, when we come out the hood, we love it because it's an escape. It's, it's getting us through the struggles. It's getting us through shit. Once you get in the industry and they throw the money at you and they throw all these things at yeah. you, you kind of get lost. It's like, I call it like, it's like you in the forest and your goal is to hunt for a lion. You hunting for food. And uh, you get in the forest and you get fascinated by the trees and the flowers and the fucking lion hunts you. Mm. 
I think it's the same way in the industry. Mm -hmm. That we come in with a certain goal, with a certain love. Most people don't even know what makes them happy no more because their happiness is attached to a compliment from somebody else. Yeah. They're seeking validation right. instead of... You yeah. have to get back to the beginning of what you and why you love music. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Word up. Um, what was it like working early with Capone and Noriego on Channel 10? That's such a beautiful beat. And did you envision the Drink Champs version of Nori back then? Mm. Nori is always Nori, man. Let's let's make that clear. There could never be another Nori. Mm -hmm. When um, we were label mates on Penalty, mm -hmm. so Neil was like, yo, I want you to do a track for Capone and Noriega. Channel 10 was done right in front of him. Wow. Okay, you made that in the studio. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's how I was taught to work. I wasn't taught to put beats on. Mm -hmm. I've learned from, like I said, large show. I would watch them do beats right there in the studio. I remember large professor used to bring the... SP12 up to Pete Rock and Marley yeah. Marl on the radio and be doing beats live on the radio. That's how I was taught because that was production to me. It was sitting and and getting your thoughts out on what you what you want to do. And I tap into something and you go, that's it. Mm -hmm. And then we build the whole from structure there. from there. It wasn't like here's some beats on a CD. Because that's that's like that's a dumb game to play, right? If I give you beats on a CD, it's what I think is hot versus what you think is hot. Mm -hmm. I think these beats fit you. You might go, this shit ain't it. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm sitting you with you in the crib and you say, just play everything, and I play everything, I get to play you some shit that I normally wouldn't put on a CD. Right. And I might play some shit and you go, that's it. That's you go, it. That? Right. Yo, that's it. And you go, right. because I know I would have never put that on a CD. Because you you can't get inside an artist's head. Not saying that you're going to get to sit and work with artists nowadays, mm -hmm. but to me, that's what I was taught. That was the art of production is really sitting with an artist and coming up with something incredible. Yeah. Like, like my favorite analogy is making a suit. You come in, mm -hmm. you know, I got some suits hanging up, but... uh. Tell I got me. some new fabric that came in. Mm -hmm. Let me size you with this. Right. And it's giving you a suit that I probably would have normally never made for you if you ain't sit here and go through the fabric with me. Yes, indeed. So you were sampled by Fatboy Slim's Mega Smash, The Rockefeller Skank. It became a global hit. How did that affect your career? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love to that this laugh. day, uh... <laughs> A lot of people don't even know that's me. Check it uh, out now, the Funk yeah, Soul Brother. I would have to say it, and they go, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> so when you hear, check it out now, the Funk Soul Brother, right about yeah. now, the Funk Soul, oh, that's, that's him. Do you know what that reminds me of, though? Bring It On. Was that in Bring It On? Yeah, it's it at was? the end. Yep. That's a, that's a Check it movie? out. No, yeah. That was I, I, no one else watched Bring It On? No one? <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> It was in that's a bunch of. That's a classic, of, but that's on a, that. It was in a bunch of joints. It's a big, huge song. Yeah. But the way they approached me about it was scandalous. Let's okay. say that. You know, because it's like, yo, we used your song in a hook, but you telling me you used my song, but you never sent me the song to listen to. Mm. Mm. Me being an advocate, knowing how hard it is to clear samples, I just say, you know what? Yeah, I'll, I'll clear that. Right. To come to find out what it is and go, yo. I wouldn't have agreed to that. Right. You know, but it was it was too late. It's, you know, lesson learned, you know. Yeah, I mean, Fatboy Slim, uh, all due respect to his musicality, but he is not the funk soul brother. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> Definitely not. Um, I did a uh yeah, Fatboy Slim, man. Yeah, that's a that record was huge. Um anyway, I was I was gonna tell a, a story, but then I, I had confused it. It was a different white person. Oh my god, you racist. <laughs> no, no, I was about to they tell a story. They don't all look alike. No, literally, I was about to tell a story about Moby. And I was like, that's not Fatboy Slim. So anyway, <laughs> shout out to OC, who you've worked with extensively. Some yeah. amazing artists. And um DITC digging into crates resurfaced in the Fat Beats era. Like when I started my career. Mm. DITC was experiencing a renaissance, a resurgence. 
uh, with Buck Wild was putting out records. You got yeah. records like Day One, which is an amazing record. Mm -hmm. Stand Strong, I feel like, is very underrated. But I want to ask you about how Fat Joe mm -hmm. stepped up in that era, lyrically. Fat Joe's, he's just, um, I'm trying to find the right word. A beast. <laughs> beast is, is, is definitely the word. Mm -hmm. But um, he has a certain energy. He's just relentless. Mm -hmm. Whatever he feels, he's he's going to bring to fruition. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think, you know, I said this in certain interviews, not in a bad way, as he wanted to be a star. Yeah. We wanted to be nice, mm -hmm. and we wanted to be respected for how nice we were. But I don't think none of us, with a, probably the exception of Big L, mm -hmm. want to be a, a star. Understood. I want to be a star. Makes a lot of sense. Fuck all that shit. Star. Right. Yeah. You want to be nice? Era, yeah, that's cool, but star. But he was, in that era, he had the records with Ja Rule and the big, huge radio records. But then he would still come fuck with DITC and do these underground records. Right. And being an artist, there's certain, certain things we put ourselves through. Mm -hmm. You know, that we want to we wanna make it on our own accord. We don't want to do it outside of our camp. Mm -hmm. Well, we would work with artists that that we loved and respected, but commercial messing with commercial artists was like kind of taboo in our era. Mm -hmm. Like if you mess with somebody that already had a hit and you go, okay, I'm going to do a song with this person, it was like kind of riding that person's coattail. Coat and I don't think a lot of us wanted to do that. Right. And there's no knock to anybody. It's just that I would work with certain artists, but certain artists that was popping, I could respect them and go, okay, that's dope. But to just say, okay, I want to do a record with that person, it would have to be, I guess, a mutual thing where they say, yo, Ness, man, we need to do something together. And maybe that would work. But I think a lot, like Joe would break those boundaries. Like, yeah. yo, fuck that. I'm I'm going to work with this dude. I'm going to work with, with this person. Like, yeah, man, Joe, I love your music. Yo, Joe, yeah, one day we need to do something. I got studio time right Where's now. Joe going right now. Right. We could do it right now? Right. Like, we wasn't on it like that. Right. But he was. So, you know, I can... Nothing but respect his his hustle. His hustle is, is is extreme, even to this day. You know, he he will do whatever it takes to do that. Yeah, and he's doing that in all different spaces and places. And uh, shout out to Joey Crack. He um, I feel Definitely. like it doesn't get more hip hop than Fat Joe. You know, it's like no, a Puerto Rican dude from the Bronx. Joe who's is like, man, I'm a kick in every door. Yeah, I'm gonna do whatever I gotta do. And like I said. Some might look at it as laziness. You know, y'all was just lazy. Some look like y'all might have been too content. Mm -hmm. Who who knows? But I, I will always respect Joe from for uh, doing that. But like to you this said, day. you said for you it's like a certain vibe. You know, one right. of my favorite beats you made is the message, Dr. Dre. And um, I know there was an original version that Dre heard. Mm. Right. right and and it's like your original version, uh, like it had Rel on it already, right? Right, it had Rel on it, and it had Crystal Johnson. It mm -hmm. didn't have Mary. Okay, but the hook was already there between Rel and Crystal Johnson, mm -hmm. and he had Mary come in and kind of do some of Rel's part, and and um, Crystal Johnson, but kept Rel on it. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of done. That was done for the album after the Awakening. Mm -hmm. But Penalty got snatched up by Tommy Boy, mm -hmm. and Penalty was no more. So that record went to Dre, you know? Right. I mean, he said he liked it, and it was like, yo, Mailman was like, yo, you know that's Ness record. Yo, tell him what, whatever he want for it. I mean, I wasn't telling him no. But he 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 he, I mean, he must have felt special about it because he rhymed. With J Dr. Dre didn't let us into his life. Right. And on that song, he's rhymed about his brother Tyree. And he's really, he's not trying to be a gangster at all. He's really just talking to us on that record. So it meant that when he heard that, he was like, yo, I got to, this is, this is where I'm talking about. That record, I mean, that music was, it was special. Certain, certain joints you do, no matter when you play it, like mm -hmm. 
Incredible music don't have no expiration. Let's get mm-hmm. that straight. Facts. That track I knew was was special. Yeah. Because everybody wanted that track. Is Method Man and Red Man, they use that in that. Is that your track that they use in their show? Well, I that's whatever. Or is it a Dre. sample? I don't know. Yeah. So they, so, it's no sample. So No, so that's you um, playing. Or that's you no, put, that's, creating that track. Um, shout out to um, Dinky Bingham. So yeah, have you seen Red and Meth dance to that? Yes. Do, 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 <laughs> yeah, do. that was that's the... like, yo, it's just crazy. First of all, Red Man and Meth the Man need to have like a workout competition because it's it's just... Oh yeah, they be on the they be on a Nah, yeah, uh, they like I, I want to see Meth the Man in the next Doctor Strange movie. Can we talk about something <laughs> I know, please? Hey man, he's just he looks like a Marvel superhero. Yeah, he's gonna be in a Marvel movie soon, I yeah. think. I I could predict that. They need to repurpose Ghost Rider and make a black Ghost Rider. Have Meth Meth as Johnny Blaze. That would be dope. You know what I'm saying? That would be incredible. Yeah. <laughs> you need to start selling your ideas because I, do. I, I mean, mean I'm coming up with all the good ones. And today. I'll be your manager, so because obviously we need to get these coins. <laughs> let's get let's do it. Let's do it. Now, one of my favorite quotes I've ever heard came from you. And it's really a, a really a philosophy for my life. And you said, success is waking up and saying, What am I gonna do today? Right. And having the freedom to just decide what you're going to do today. That's very rare. And that's a, that's a privilege, right? Because right. most people's lives are not like that. Most people have to wake up and do what they got to do. Financial freedom. Yeah. Right? It's that. And I always say having options. Mm-hmm. Having options will always keep your value. Mm-hmm. If you always have to say yes to everything, then how can you build your value? Yes. If you always have to say yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. And people got to learn that word no. No, man. Mm -hmm. You got to learn that word no, and you got to know the consequences of yes. Yes. Consequences of yes is knowing that as soon as you say yes to anybody or anything, you're responsible for the consequences that come with it, no matter how it goes. You know, because we always say yes. It's easy to say yes. Mm -hmm. How many times somebody be like, yo, Talib, man, we should do so-and-so, and you soon say yes. So uh, Monday at 8, I need you at, you know, they really press you on that. Yes. Mm -hmm. What I also learned is no will tell you your true people. Ooh, can you speak that again? Just one more time. No will tell you your true people Mm -hmm. because sometimes you got to say no and you get to see how people respond and act when you say no. Yes. Uh, Sometimes I say no just to fuck with people, just to see (laughs) how you going to act. Yes. Jared knows I'll be doing that in the group chat. Is that, is, oh, oh, is, that what you're, is that what you're doing? That's what I'll be doing. It, Keep them on their toes. You know yeah. what? Keep them on their toes. What I would say, Lord Finesse, one of the hardest things to do, especially as a woman in this industry, is to say no. Because when you're saying no, it's like, oh, you're hard to work with. Oh, you're a diva. Oh, you're this, whatever. And it's like saying no with no explanation, with no apologies. Just like, nope, can't do it. It's like, that is like one of the hardest things to do, but then also it's just like one of the most like. What I what I learned on that is once you dig deep in yourself and you reflect and you know your flaws and you know why you made the decisions you made, well, you know everything about you and Not you accept yourself. it. You don't have to worry about that, no. Mm-hmm. And you ain't asking nobody for their opinion because you know who the fuck you are. You say it again. Mm-hmm. You know, but if you don't know who you are, you're always asking, what you think? Yeah. What should I? What? And, and you, you on that fucking hamster wheel. Yeah. That hamster wheel is a motherfucker, man, because if, if man, if you perform for the applause, you're going to die from the criticism. Yep. Oh man, that's a bar right there. Yeah, man. Uh, my 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 homie London Brown is the second time I mentioned him today. He says that, and he also says, "Don't let your highs get too high. And don't let your lows get too low." Because you don't want to be like dictating your day by what amazing happened. You just want to wake up and say, "I'm gonna have a great day." Not only that, but I learned that what I what I also learned two things: don't stress what you can't control. Peace of mind is the most valuable thing you can own. Stop trying to figure people out. Mm. Every time you try to figure somebody out, you wasting valuable, productive time on some other shit you could be doing, and you trying to figure out some goofy shit, some dumb Word. shit. Word. Once you once you get within you and you know who you are, it's easy to read everybody else. Right. 
because most of everybody else ain't fixed themselves. They yeah. still doing the dumb shit you was doing already. Word. So I think once you you learn things about yourself and you center yourself around good people, people that aspire you without telling you shit. Yes. People that you look at and go, I get my shit together. These yes. motherfuckers doing it. Mm-hmm. And, and don't compare because comparison is a thief of joy. Mm. Just know what makes you happy and live life within that. And you're going to have fun. You're going to have so much fun. But when you start looking at everything and this person doing this and where do I fit and nah, just do what you've been doing. If if it got you to a certain level, it's going to get you further. But just be yourself and put a purpose behind your passion. Cheers. A purpose behind your passion. That's the word for this episode. Thank you for the gems. Uh, so what is next for Lord Finesse? Oh man, I'm I'm doing a bunch of things, man. Um, I'm just really just building different things, uh, because I think as a being a hip hop artist and a producer, they tend to pigeonhole you, mm-hmm. and once they pigeonhole you, you don't look at other opportunities that you would take because people only think you could do one thing. Mm-hmm. So I was blessed to do the Motown State of Mind album that's on all platforms where they let me uh, mess with the Marvin and the Michael. And it's so and, good. Uh, Just every, anybody who's anybody who's into music, a DJ, whatever, producer, if you haven't heard some of these remixes that Lord Finesse has done under his moniker, the Underboss. The Underboss, the Underboss. So good. Which is credited to Fat Joe. He gave me that title. Um, I did the Barry White, Never Gonna Give You Up. Um, I've worked on this project, Next Level Nostalgia. It's really me re-recording the Awakening, and I did a bunch mm. of tracks, and I just didn't finish it up. I did the SP twelve hundred project too. That's done. It's a good project. I like that. Album. Like, uh, I just been just trying to work. I got I got a series that I'm working on. I don't want to talk about it yet. Okay. But it's, it's definitely with a knowledge, a lot of knowledge of music. It's mm. a series behind the knowledge of music. Um, my thing is, what made the 90s special, what made the 90s incredible, it was a certain vibe. It was the vibe of originality. It was a vibe for digging for the, the craziest, wildest loops and tunes and drums. And, you know, and a lot of people try to replicate that era but you have to know the origin to replicate it. So my series is somewhat talking about that mm. in a nutshell. Well, it is our honor and our pleasure to have you on the show. It's long overdue. We done bumped into each other That's like, right. every which way. And I was like, yo, I'll, nah, just hit me up. I'll That's do right. the show. For me to be able... Uh, I enjoy the fact that I have a relationship with you, but I was telling a friend of mine earlier today, I said, I, I said that. I said, I bumped into Lord Finesse so many times, but I've right. never got a chance to really express to him what he means to my art and my career. And mm-hmm. so I appreciate the opportunity to do that here with you. Man, I, I appreciate being here. I mean, I like I said, with music, man, it's just that you want to just see what we do, just carry on, mm-hmm. elevate, evolve, you know? And so, you know, I told you what my 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 album was. Right. You know, like I said, you did the song with Roy. You did the song. All right, with the Pete. eardrum. You like the you, eardrum. Yeah, that that album is a musical masterpiece, Thank man. You, I ain't. It's so many songs, and that's what I miss hearing an album that just got more than two or three songs. Yeah. Yes. How many songs Eardrum had on it? Eighteen, nineteen songs. That yeah. album was dope, and you know, people always try to say. You know, people got a, a a low attention span. They do. That's bullshit. It's low attention because that shit is trash. You know, <laughs> don't pay attention to that shit. Yes, indeed. Well, and if you put out. if you put out an incredible album, <laughs> I mean, from front to back, people don't want to do interludes no more. Put out a great piece of work. Right. I mean, you're going to listen to it again and over and over, but it has to be properly put together. 20 yeah. is too many. Right now, like even the albums I work on, like the Black Star album we just put out, new albums I'm working on, what I'm doing now is no longer am I working on albums song by song. Right. When, I, when, we, when, I, when I'm like, you know, you, be, you work on a song and you be like, play that song from the beginning? Nah. 
play the album from the beginning. Mm-hmm. That's right. how I do now. Every time I it, record it something new, it, play it, from the top of the album. So it don't hear have no. Fit. Don't put no regulations on it. It gotta yeah. be. Fucking three verses. Right. Fucking verse that's hook. Whatever you feel like doing, if that shit is dope, make motherfucking press rewind, man. Press we don't rewind. we don't have rewind no more, man. Repeat. And people make these lists. I see artists get bent out of shape with these lists and shit. Yo, they made the top fifty. Them lists is only as good as the the motherfucking person with the knowledge. That's the right. person don't have a knowledge of the fucking eras and the decades. They list is gonna be shit. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor <laughs> and my pleasure to have the Funk Soul Brother, the Funky Man, with the fade and the half moon. <laughs> <laughs> I love finesse on the people's party. <laughs>